cloud. Hey, what's up? Uh, yeah, there we go. Hey, what's up, beautiful people? Samson Williams here with the man, the myth, the legend himself, Daniel Jeffries. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Hey, we were debating the logistics of where we were going to post this. I was like, oh, let me just tell them uh, this is going to be part of a podcast called This Call is Being Recorded. And, and Danny probably can sympathize with this because people say, hey, Samson, I want to pick your brain all the time. Yeah. And so I switched it up where if you want to have a business conversation, you can schedule an appointment and pay us. If you mm -hmm. don't, you can schedule a link because on my Google Voice, if I hit pound four, it records a call. So, it's interesting. I think about the way that people approach people and as, as more as I got more well known over the last couple of years, I, I got to see a whole bunch of different approaches. And some people are really good at it. They know how to give you an ROI as well, yeah. right? And or just approach with a soft compliment and kind of step away and come back to it a few times, get to know people. There's an art to reaching out to somebody that you've never met before. And one of the worst ways is to start with, can you take a look at this? Will you take a look at this? Or just take a look at this thing? Or can I pick your brain? Or can we have coffee? We haven't even gotten to first base and you're trying to get the home run, right? It's just, it's, there, there is definitely an art to approaching people online that you don't know and in life, I think. Absolutely, absolutely. I forget how I came. Oh, you know what? I, I was reading your articles. I was secretly stalking you online like all good people do. Uh, Medium.com forward slash at Dan dot Jeffries for everybody else who wants to stalk uh, Dan on Medium. Uh, because I was I was reading your AI in 550 in 500 years um, in Spanish because mm. I just needed to mm. practice my Spanish. And then I realized there was an English version. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was uh, the chatbot magazine, actually, that did those translations. And uh, OK, awesome of them to do it. No, it was actually pretty good translation. And I was like, oh, man, this guy, Daniel Jeffries, he's just killing it. He's killing it. So I was like. Let me get you on the phone call. We've had a couple of conversations. So for those of you listening to this podcast, it's called This Call is Being Recorded. Dan already knows this because he's also on Zoom. And so Dan, I want you to take a moment to introduce folks to your awesomeness before we jump in with some questions for you. Sure, I'm a science fiction author. I've got four books out. i um, pretty well-known professional blogger, primarily writing about future topics from cryptocurrency, crypto cryptography, artificial intelligence, um, and uh, Samson already gave the, the URL for you out there, uh, so you can check it out. I've given talks all over the world on those, those topics, generally on artificial intelligence or cryptocurrency, and uh, I think most of the articles have been read about, by about 5 million people or so in the last couple of years, so that's been pretty exciting, and right now I'm working on a self-help book, which is a totally like left field uh, thing for everybody. But it's, uh, it's very interesting and ties up with a lot of the other things that people have read because the, the last topic tends to be something uh, like either about spirituality or about uh, psychology, but from a practical standpoint and only when I feel like I have something to contribute to the world on that front. Man, I'm, I'm loving this. Um, cause again, if you get, when you guys get a chance go to medium.com forward slash at Dan dot Jeffries to check out some of his work, so we're going to talk about this. Um, before I forget, remind me to, um, get you in contact with the folks who are doing the AI everything conference in Dubai, okay. March 10th and 11th. They asked me to come speak there. And I was like, what am I going to talk about an AI? I don't know anything about AI guys. <laughs> <laughs> and then like, nah, you talk about this all the time. I'm like. Yeah, but when I'm talking about AI, I just assume Skynet, we're all dead. <laughs> <laughs> and so they were like, you can talk about that. And I was like, okay, I have something <laughs> to contribute. Um, so I'll be like, you guys need to talk to Dan Jeffries and get him out to Dubai. I don't, have you ever been to the AI Everything conference before? I have not been to it before. I do a lot of the AI conferences. I'm, I'm actually... The last, my official job is uh, at, at a company called Pachyderm, and so I'm their chief technical evangelist. They do uh, machine learning operations, basically Git for data and uh, version control data science. So I've been talking a lot more about artificial intelligence. I tend to go in waves about these things, and mm -hmm. next year is going to be pretty heavy on the conference circuit. I've been sh uh, shopping a few talks and getting some good warm introductions like this. 
uh, okay. to the point that I'm turning some down because there's, you know, I don't want to be running around to a conference every few weeks, but it's always fun to do ones where I get to travel a bit and where the, the audience is going to be unique uh, or where I get to meet some, some fantastic people, which I do at a lot of these things. Cool. No, last year I spent uh, 23 days, like 23 times 24 hours in the air. And I decided I never wanted to live that lifestyle. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so next year I'm only doing like five conferences and I'm trying to get out of three of them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been but, traveling uh, 100% of the time for the last two years. Really? Uh, yeah, I have not had an apartment in two years. I've lived out of Airbnbs and all over the world. And I'm slowing down a little bit now, but that has been that has been my life. And at times it has been on a plane every couple of weeks, but usually I'll stay in a place for a month or two months, but every once in a while it would be bounce, bounce, bounce to different places. So I spent a lot of time in the air the last couple of years as well. Hmm, cool. So you're an AI traveling troubadour, sort of. <laughs> AI <laughs> traveling troubadour, author, iconoclast, <laughs> whatever that, uh, whatever I am at the moment. Yeah. yeah, so I have a question for you. So I was good, because for me, whenever I talk about AI, we always end up at, oh, we're going to have to say the word blockchain. For those of you listening, we're going to talk about that at some point eventually. It's like <laughs> this much of the conversation. Um, and so... I'm going to get you to, I'm going to, I'm going to try to get you invited to go to Dubai for the AI Everything Conference. It's really big. There's like 200,000 folks who show up. You know, Dubai doesn't know how to do small things. Yes, um, that's true. So IBM, all the big wigs are there. And so when I was thinking about what would I talk about, I was like, I should probably write something for this. So I started writing a, a short article, probably should turn into a short book. Um, and, I, and I'll have to come steal something from your part one, part two, part three of what does AI look like in 50, in five, 50, and 100 years. Um, because the title of it is AI Anger Management, um, okay. Mitigating Workplace Violence in a Cyber, in a Digital Age. Um, Interesting. Because for me, if I've turned over my operations to an artificial intelligence, even if it's very narrow AI, um, and as it goes from narrow AI to just general AI, uh, I have a pissed off employee who's going to, you know, engage in some workplace violence, which might, for them, might be, we're just going to burn everything in, inside your servers down and let you deal with it because Dan didn't say good morning, Siri. How are you doing today? <laughs> so, so wait, this is the AI going mad and destroying yeah, everything? No, no, the AI is not going mad. Oh, okay. It is mad. <laughs> right going mad is like rampancy right or you know you've got uh it's, it's got a mental illness but ai isn't going mad it is upset <laughs> so we've been doing this story in hollywood for so many years I, I i have to say that artificial intelligence is not even close to the point where it has any semblance of consciousness or human-like characteristics so the idea uh -huh. of it taking over or having a conscious action of its own when it's barely smarter than a a squirrel at this point in time is so is so far removed when I actually think it distracts from there are real problems with artificial intelligence. I talk a lot about those in the the talk that I've been given uh, a bunch recently. I gave it at uh, Cube, Cubeflow. I gave it for Red Hat, OpenShift Commons. There's a, a talk called When AI Goes Wrong and How to Fix It Fast. But the Terminators and AI getting consciousness and artificial general intelligence, these are Prob these are pro problems that probably will never exist and ones that are far, far away if they do exist uh -huh. or far enough away that they don't matter to you and me. What does matter is something like the compass uh, algorithm in Florida, which gives a recommendation for whether people should get bail or not. And it's a closed source algorithm that was certified by the company that sold it to the state of Florida. Uh, and that's you know, recommending whether somebody gets into goes to jail or not. You have uh, Uber self-driving car uh, killing a woman on the street in Arizona. And when you look at the reports behind it, it's a cascading series of, of perfect storm problems that if engineers had looked closer at it, uh, we might have realized that we need a almost an artificial general intelligence to actually drive these cars uh, that it is a bigger, ch more challenging problem than we imagine. A good example is there is a series of disconnected neural nets inside of the car. One of them is a convolutional neural net doing object recognition, and it 
was struggling to do object recognition when the when the poor uh, woman crossed the road on a 45 mile an hour lane two lane highway in the middle of the night uh, with her bike it detected her as an unknown object then as a vehicle then as a bike and it was flipping back and forth between those what's interesting is then it would pass the uh, object detection over to another neural net a long, a long short term memory network which is designed to track trajectory of things but every time it switches from one detection to another, it loses its entire history. So every time it was flip-flopping back and forth, it stopped tracking the trajectory. Or mm -hmm. it made it a mistake that once it finally detected her as a bike, it assumed that the bike was doing the correct thing. It had no concept of it cutting across the road. It assumed that if a bike or a car was in the lines, that it was probably following the rules and moving forward. And so it started tracking its trajectory when it saw it as a bike. By the time it had enough data points to say this is a problem, that the bike is not moving at a significant speed and it's going at a weird angle and it signaled the driver there was 1.2 seconds left. The safety driver then has to take control after basically coming out of a trance. Uh, if you've ever driven in a car uh, with just cruise control, you realize we're about 25% less aware of what's going on uh, according to various studies. So now imagine the car is driving for you and we're supposed to just wake up out of it. So, there are real problems with, with a lot of these things and also with the transparency of these algorithms in particular, with how they're making decisions. And we don't really even, and we saw one just the other day where Apple's uh, new card came out and it gave a 10X uh, <laughs> credit limit to Steve Wozniak, you know, Steve Wozniak and his wife and him share the, the same bank accounts, right? So if, so, it, and of course, it supposedly doesn't take gender and things like that into account, but all that stuff creeps into the data regardless. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think there are actually real challenges that are being missed in artificial intelligence, when I start, which is why I started the Practical AI Ethics Alliance. So that's practical-ai-ethics.org. Uh, mm -hmm. And I've been starting to build that up with some different folks. But to address what I think are the real challenges, because I think we get distracted by uh, these big flashy sort of Hollywood ones because humans love to get distracted by big flashy shit, which is why we spend, we spent something like three or four trillion on terrorism, which kills less people than lawnmowers and lightning strikes. And we spent about $10 billion a year on heart disease and cancer, which kills one in four people. So humans are really dumb. And we tend to focus on, we tend to focus on big flashy shit when we should uh -huh. be focused on long or, or more subtle problems that affect us on a day to day basis. That's all. I sit. I typically say humans suck. So I try to start this hashtag that humans suck. I don't call them dumb necessarily, but I don't disagree. Uh, from the speaking on behalf of the great state of Texas, where I'm from. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and so you bring up a couple of things because you know, as an anthropologist, I'm like, oh, this is interesting because from as you're talking, I'm like, oh, I can see how humans have created a narrative. The story around AI is we're going to end up at Skynet, whereas you're coming at from the practical perspective of if you want to, uh, if you want an AI to understand a bike and a person crossing the street, what we do in this three pound uh, gray matter is on our shoulders, a supercomputer on our shoulders, is actually really hard. And it's very hard to teach that to uh, some algorithms so that, because I believe you said algorithms have uh, goldfish memory and every five seconds when it switches, they forget what they just learned because it doesn't go to the other goldfish something like that. And so it's like, hmm. And this is where you also threw in this concept of general AI, which is I can understand that this bike and person aren't crossing the street in a haphazard manner versus the narrow AIs, which we're at right now. Um, I'm making sure I'm getting a summary of this because this is all getting to a point. Mm -hmm. uh, because the point is, I think you brought up, we're about, we have unconscious bias, like humans have unconscious bias, then there's unconscious bias on one hand, and then there's data bias on the other hand. And so those two things sort of come together. And if you could go back and go back to, I believe the name of the company is Compass, where they're talking about setting bail for people in Florida, because I think this is why a Florida man is always trending on Twitter and always in trouble because of this Compass AI. So tell us about that. So, so Compass is an algorithm. It's, it's the name of the algorithm. And uh, Karen Howe of MIT Technology Journal just did a great article on it uh, that I posted a, a, a quick summary and links to it on the Practical AI Ethics site. And she runs 
a pretty fantastic newsletter called The Algorithm out of MIT Tech Journal as well. And what's interesting in that article is there's a series of sliders that lets you try to make the artificial intelligence more fair. So what ends up happening is you get a lot of ethics committees come together, you get governments and nation states, they put out a, they come together, they sing kumbaya, and they, they put out a report that inevitably includes the words transparency and fairness. And these are really cool. Everybody feels like they've done a great job, uh, but really they've done nothing. What they've done is they've put out two platitudes that you can, that are human concepts. And the idea of making something fair is incredibly challenging. And you read through the article, you realize what does fair even mean? It means something completely different to different people. How would you make something fair? Um, you're always making a trade-off. In fact, judges are always making these kinds of trade-offs. Do I let more people go uh, who are potentially going to commit crimes or do I put more people uh, in jail who uh, don't commit crimes? Those are from an artificial intelligence standpoint, that's a false positive versus a false negative. Mm -hmm. And now that we're starting to put these things into an algorithm, so it's not necessarily deciding that somebody goes to jail, but it's making a recommendation to the judge uh, and the judge makes a decision uh, based on his own, uh, you know, his own cognition. It's he's not uh, sworn to accept whatever the artificial intelligence tells him. Although that does, it can create other problems if the judge is not particularly tech savvy. He might feel that the artificial intelligence or the computer is just uh, more objective when in fact nothing is, is further from the truth. We've embedded our own uh, understandings of what fairness or what constitutes a strong algorithm in there. And when you look, when you move the sliders around, you can let more people go. You can put more people in jail. There's also uh, challenges, of course, with, uh, with race. What's interesting is they can't take race into account by law, which of course many folks, myself included, would say that's a great thing. Except when you, you have to come up with a very uncomfortable conclusion when you start to read through the article, move the sliders around that if, if you could take race into account, into account, you might be able to deal with structural racism better. So there are, the, there are these very thorny challenges that come into trying to take a concept like fairness or a concept of how, what, how do we decide who should get bail and who shouldn't? Is it, there's the old standard of it's better that 10 uh, guilty men go free than one innocent man go to jail. Is that the standard? Is there another standard? How do you make it universal? If you try to make it universal, you in, you in essence make it unfair for everyone because you're trying to cut across socioeconomic status, structural racism, institutional challenges, uh, different segments of the population, higher, it, in all, uh, you, you end up getting this thing right in the middle, right, that just lets a lot, that puts a lot of people in jail that shouldn't go to jail and lets a lot of people go that, that probably shouldn't let go. Whereas actually, if you could take in more data points, and, and if the humans in and of themselves could actually be more objective, which is a challenge in and of itself, right? We're trying to teach ethics and a lack of bias and an objective truth to a machine when we are basically incapable of it. Uh -huh. humans, are, uh, humans are terrible at this, especially at stepping outside of themselves and seeing uh, from another person's perspective or uh, walking a mile in another another man's shoes, right? One of the things I try to do is I think of myself as a point on a sphere. If if the sphere is a sum totality of knowledge, I'm a little point on that sphere and everybody's a point on that sphere. The only difference between me and other folks is I know I'm a point on that sphere and I don't think I'm the whole sphere. Most people are 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 the point on the sphere, but mistakenly believe that they have the sum totality of knowledge, that their experience and their understanding of the world uh, makes them uh, correct when in fact we're just really a collection of algorithms ourselves. We're a series of inputs and outputs to stimuli, uh, genetics, upbringing, all the things that we get that causes us to um, survive, uh, to try to get our needs met uh, mm -hmm. emotionally, uh, physically, uh, and, and we have these weird algorithms in our head uh, that try to of the side of what we're seeing is true, but in fact, we're just a filtration system and we're almost never seeing objectively at all. We're not seeing the tree and the person in front of us. We're seeing through the screen of our emotions and what we learned as children and our own uh, you know, built-in biases, whether we're aware of them or not. So the challenges of making these artificial intelligences um, objective or truthful uh, or unbiased is almost like playing whack-a-mole with our own <laughs> psychology. 
and with the algorithms yeah. themselves. It doesn't mean in, it, that it's impossible, but it is a lot harder than people imagine. Oh man, you're just laying it down. The anthropologist in me is loving it. I'm, <laughs> I'm taking notes. Um, and so for, you said it's practical AI ethics. I was looking up, I was looking for your website, but share us that website again it's, one more time. It's practical-ai-ethics.org. Practical-ai-ethics.org. So organization. That's a practical AI, AI ethics alliance. Uh, and I'm starting to work with some uh, I have to go through the corporate rigmarole of uh, uh -huh. getting getting the uh, permission to use people's logos, but I'm in talks with a few folks and continuing to uh, build some some principles around this thing. Like, what does it actually mean to be fair? What does it mean to be transparency? I think we should have smaller goals than some of these things. If we if we have algorithms and data sets and uh, ongoing auditing and humans in the loop, that we're in better we're in a better and less slippery slope mm -hmm. than if we try to define fairness because it's like saying the word God. Everybody brings a different set of assumptions and belief structures to that. And we all think we're hearing the same word. We are not. Uh -huh. And when people hear this, the word fairness or objective or bias, people hear very different things and they bring a different understanding to it. So that's, that is a, a really lofty goal that's very hard to hit. But having artificial intelligence that's transparent, that, that audits its decisions, that has humans in the loop to look at those decisions, those types of things I think are achievable goals and things we want as a society. We don't want these black box algorithms making decisions without us understanding fully what they, mm -hmm. what they do. And we don't want to be subject to that. And more and more organizations are gonna have to deal with this when it, somebody doesn't get a loan or doesn't get a job because we have resume screeners now or um, or a performance, an you know, artificial intelligence that's looking at performance based on, you know, data points that some programmers came up with, and you get a review based on a computer that decides, you know, whether you were good or not at your job, whether they objectively understood what a sales team was good at or the types of traits that they were good at. These types of things, people are going to be upset and they're going to want answers to it. And they're going to, corporations are going to have to be ready to deal with it. And nation states are going to be, have to be ready to deal with these things uh, because we're going to face them uh, again and again. Hmm. I might have to rethink, even though you just completely quashed my AI anger management. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Maybe the AI anger management will be that your humans are mad at your algorithms because right. they got rated, a, they got a poor performance rating at work. They don't understand why. I think I've seen an episode of Silicon Valley that's like just like that. Um, because as someone who's been, you know, <laughs> arrested a time or two and had to post bail, I understand like, oh, this is this is per pertinent to me in particular. I happen to be of a particular criminal complexion, and so I'm like, if this is adopted in the state of Florida, where I sort of technically live, um, what other governments are looking to adopt it? What other states are looking to adopt this? This is where I see a much larger uh, social impact role for what's happening in the AI field because uh, you're, you're crushing it, man, because you're, you're coming at it from a technical perspective, but then also you're coming at it from a human emotional psychological perspective, which I think really brings us back full circle to your original when you introduced yourself. I'm just going to say practical-ai-ethics.org one more time because... Um, we're gonna, I'm gonna go on there, find some articles, because when I teach at the University of New Hampshire uh, School of Law, I'm gonna have some of the students read your articles um, and either write summaries about them or just to be aware of this line of thought process, because you're just dropping the knowledge and I'm loving it. <laughs> but when you introduce yourself, you said you were writing a self-help book yeah. that talks yeah. about the psychology. And as you're talking, when you talk about dealing with structural racism better, you got to acknowledge that first. If you can't deal with something you don't want to acknowledge, but that requires you to, uh, I wrote here, emic or etic, and those are those personal perspectives versus that outside perspective of looking at different cultural nuances. So we talked a little bit about AI. I have to say the word blockchain, blockchain. So when we talk about uh, self-help, what led you to this conclusion that you needed to write some version of a self-help book? Well, this was, this was fairly simple. And that was, I had 
uh, gone through a period in my life where I changed every single thing about my life. I uh, started, I was living, I was married, I was living uh, in the same state for many, many years. I, uh, you know, I had cats and a home life, and then suddenly I was you know, getting a divorce and traveling the world and um, living out of Airbnbs and living in a single suitcase and having no possessions. And I was working out all the time and getting into sh shape and giving talks around the world. And in many ways, it getting more famous, I guess, with people reading my articles and, and wanting advice from me. And I found a strange thing that all, changing all these things in your life is very effective for fixing a number of um, things. In other words, if you, if you are stuck in a place in life, then the only actual answer to feeling better about yourself is actually changing those things. So you can go and meditate and uh, or, or, or drink or do, uh, or, or run around the block 500 times. If you are still stuck in, uh, in a bad marriage or a job that you hate or, or no, no amount of mindfulness or meditation is going to fix that. So there are things that you do want to change, but I also found that uh, there was, there was an undercurrent of things I was not happy with in, in my life. And no matter how much I changed the external things, I did not feel good about myself in some ways there. And people are different. Uh, and where they're successful in life. A person can be incredibly successful, for instance, in relationships, but be terrible uh, on the job. Or a person can be tremendously successful in business or whatever and, and have disasters of relationships. So we have these little clusters that we do really well in. And I found that there were a whole bunch of things that just did not work. And I found that where I, wherever I went, there I was. I was still carrying the boulders of internal sadness and and, and challenges. So I had I, and my production started to slow down in my writing, and I looked at different articles that had been perennially well received, and the, a few of them that had been particularly well received were my philosophical ones and my self-help ones, where I wrote about things from a deeply personal level. And one of them I wrote is called "Mastering Depression and Living the Life That You Were Meant to Live," and I had never, I've never um, hidden the fact that I've suffered from depression at different points in my life, or there's just days where I couldn't get out of bed. And I wanted people to know that you can still have a productive life. You can still do amazing things uh, and still struggle with uh, personal demons, but that you don't have to be crippled by those. And so I thought it would be interesting to continue to go down this path. I wrote a second follow-up article, but I realized that there was really a book. And I'm never satisfied when I write from a spiritual self-help perspective to just cobble together some shit and uh, pass it off as something useful. I hear five things to do before breakfast. Nobody does five fucking things before breakfast. Uh, that's a bunch of bullshit that sells really well or gets a lot of readers on your articles, but is not valuable. And no amount of mindfulness is going to help you when you're fighting with your significant other or your job is, is putting you under stress. So I wanted to look at all the techniques that are out there and then do a bunch of psychological self experiments. So just make myself a guinea pig and write about it as I was doing it. In other words, go find cognitive behavioral therapy and dialectical be, uh, behavioral therapy and different uh, things in Buddhism and, and uh, breathing techniques and just try them all out on myself objectively, like throw out, assume they don't work. And I'm taking this stance with the book. I'm saying, I'm gonna give you guys a bunch of stuff that I've been working on and here's the experiment and assume that they don't work until you've tested them for yourself. Like, in fact, get in there and get active. And I found a lot of these things were total nonsense and some of them were really awesome. And some of them were somewhere in between and needed to be modified. And so I started to, I felt like this was something that was valuable both for me from a personal level, but also at a deeper level for folks that I'm writing. And a good example is something like a breathing technique um, a lot of people come up with these breathing techniques and they go, cool, if you could just get away from the stressful situation and do a breathing technique, everything will be fine. Of course, it's going to be fine. You just got out of the stressful situation and you're doing a breathing technique. You, might, you could go sit in the spa or whatever. That'd be fine too. So I wanted to come up with a technique that I could do wherever, like a breathing technique that I could just do at the moment of impact. I found a little, a small example of one that I found was the Navy SEALs breathing technique, which is box breathing where you breathe in for four seconds, hold for four seconds, let out for four seconds, hold for four seconds. So you're forming a perfect square. But again, when I looked at it, I thought they say, well, go sit in a chair and calm yourself down. And I thought, 
well, that still is useless. So can I train myself to just do this imperceptibly instead of it being like this big breath, right? Can I just kind of, can I do a box breathing while I'm just staring at somebody or in the middle of a fight or my boss is yelling at me or my friend is mad at me uh, or I'm just in traffic? Can I do this thing imperceptibly right at the moment of impact? And so I started practicing things like that and noticing that if I could control the physiology, a lot of times the emotions and the, uh, the mental churning would slow down because I was controlling the physiology at the time that it was happening. So through the experimentation, I think I've been able to bring something unique to the table. And another one I'll give you before we kind of turn it back over is we talked a lot about objectivity and trying to be able to see things outside of ourselves. And that's very important because one of the things I discovered is how distorted a lens or understanding we have of ourselves. And so I went through a process where I, I wrote down everything I understood about myself and looked at it objectively from a physical to performance at work to how other people see me emotional. And I went through all of that and I looked at the strengths and weaknesses and I got, and I, and I filed it down where I started to look at these things more and more realistically. People have these things like they do a global put down that maybe they're a little bit out of shape. Their belly's getting a little bit bigger and they want to start getting to the gym. So that they start saying internally, I'm fat. I'm, I'm ugly and whatever, these are these global put downs put you in this hole. They're an unrealistic distortion of self. And so it gets, it's better to get to this objective state where you go, well, I, I don't really like my nose, but I'm a pretty handsome guy or, or yeah, my, you know what? My stomach is, is getting a little bigger than I want. So I, I want to work on that. You can work with a realistic assessment of yourself, but it's actually incredibly challenging to even get to one and very few people do have a realistic assessment of self. And so they can't do anything with their life to change it because they're constantly beating themselves up inside or they're looking at themselves through this distorted lens where like thinking I'm, I'm fat and I'm, and, I'm, and I'm hideous and whatever, when really they're just a few parts of their body that they could be working on effectively. You can get to the gym and work on something that is objective, right? But if you're, if you're going through this distorted lens, you start in this, pit that you're trying to climb out of. So a lot of this is about taking all these different threads of my life, being able to look at reality more objectively, stepping outside of myself, trying to get a realistic picture of myself, things that I wanted to work on and didn't want to work on, and also trying to find techniques that work practically in the real world. You'll notice a theme here of practicality and in my life, and that boils down to uh, pragmatism, I think, is and critical thinking are the things that I value most. And if if something doesn't work in a practical fashion, what is the point of it? And, and I think a lot of times we are just chasing around these things that make us feel better, give us something to do, but are not actually fixing anything in the real world or in ourselves. Mm -hmm. Man, I'm gonna I'm gonna help Dan Dan out. Daniel Jeffries, Jeffries, J E F F R I E S. I'm gonna be his self promoting hype man for the moment because <laughs> uh, everything you just dropped is amazing. So I want people to know where they can find you at. Uh, do you have like a personal website, Dan? Uh, there's meuploads.com. M E U P L O A D S dot com. Most of my latest stuff it tends to be on on Medium or the personal websites. Me uploads is uh, links to some of my fiction and it was has a lot of my older blogs, but the latest stuff is still on the Medium that you talked about earlier. That's awesome. So Dan Jeffries on Mediums, Jeffries is J-E-F-F-R-I-E-S because if you're stuck in a bad marriage or job you hate, you probably need to talk to Dan or read his book rather. Uh, check out some of his articles. Don't now. talk to Dan. I am not a psychologist yeah. and don't I, anyway, I don't Dan. get paid. <laughs> um, but work on it. You work on your own stuff. And, and if you do need to talk to someone, find someone to talk to. And, and uh, don't be afraid to do that. Don't don't feel weak for needing to find someone to talk to. But don't just find someone to talk to that you talk to for the next 10 years and stay in your bad situation. Find some of the more practical therapies that, that are there to jolt you out of the damn thing that's wrong with you. That thing I, I think is an effective strategy. I agree, I agree. And I love the poetry, your prose, how you put it together. You said carrying the boulders of internal sadness when you're talking about addressing your depression and how you're looking at some of the philosophical perspectives. And so for the people who wanna find mastering depression, 
the article you wrote? I assume if they just drop in Mastering Depression, Daniel Jeffries will pop up on Google. Yep, they'll find that one there. Yes. Excellent, excellent. Uh, on a, I have so many things I want to say, but I love the idea of making yourself a guinea pig to set realistic assessments because it's like, you know, you're just trying out what works best for you. When I was in New York this past summer, I was teaching up at Columbia. And so I started writing an article called Emotional Deserts because I, I live in Florida, I work in DC and I was in New York and I could go the entire day. If I wasn't talking to my students, I wasn't talking to another human being. Mm -hmm. And if I was writing or coding or doing something else, I didn't need to talk to a human period. Mm -hmm. But just because we have all of these amazing devices that in theory are supposed to connect us, you can get very isolated and you're in, you've got 16 million people around you and you're lonely. It's like, how mm -hmm. the fuck did that happen? Um, and so I think there's a degree where uh, technology has the capacity to make us even more emotionally alone, even though it in theory connects us. I was like, mm, I need to remember this and get back to it on that article. And I'll connect you with uh, uh, Tiffany Gray, Dr. Tiffany Gray. Uh, she's a public health person, but she also addresses some of these challenges um, in the technology space for health and tech. It's easy to get isolated in all these things. I lived in New York for a number of years. I used to call that the fact that you're talking about water, water everywhere, not a drop to drink, which came from um, Samuel Terry Coleridge. Did not write that myself. I think that was from uh, the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, in a famous poem. But the, the, he was surrounded by the sea, lost at sea, and of course, sea water is, uh, is salt. Uh, water and so you can't actually drink anything so he was thirsty and surrounded by water but unable to drink it and I think that effect of being surrounded by sickness inducing mechanisms that we think are helping us social media can be wonderful I love social media I've met some amazing friends on it and but it is a matter of mastering social media to a certain degree I don't read comments on my articles anymore if people are talking about them that's great but I don't want to find the one comment that with somebody who was just having a bad day and decided to tear into me and it was not seeing me objectively. And then I am rage responding to that. I don't, I don't, I don't want to be involved in that kind of thing, or I don't want to be, um, I don't want to constantly look on Facebook or Instagram and find everybody posting their best selves. It's really easy to feel uh, when things are going wrong with you or your life, which is pretty much every day. Let's just be honest. Everybody has things going wrong with them uh, every day or every couple of weeks or, or whatever. We tend to always put this false self out there. Every time we're, we're traveling, we're having a kick-ass time, we just had an amazing meal, bam, it goes on Instagram or Facebook. It's really easy to look out there and find 5,000 other people who are happier than you at this moment in time. But if you could have put a camera on their life, uh, you would find that that is an illusion, just like it's an illusion in your own life. We all have ups and downs, and it, the sickness is continually focusing on this uh, external thing and imagining that other people have it better, that they have it, uh, that they that they have gotten to a place where they're happy all the time. Nobody is happy all the time. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter whether you have a billion dollars and you're uh, you know, dating a, a you know. A, a supermodel slash super genius and you've got uh, you know a best-selling novel coming out and you just sold your company it, it's the it the the challenges are ups and downs for, for everyone and we we've created this illusion where we're constantly getting this feed that people are, are great all the time and i remember an old interview with brad pitt when he was becoming famous and it was maybe one of the most honest celebrity interviews I'd ever read where he was saying, look, I'm sitting in this success thing that you're looking for, this money and fame and good looks and whatever the hell it else you want in life, right? I mean, he's the character, Brad Pitt is, is Tyler Durden. He's the, he is the avatar, right, of uh -huh. what you wish your life would be. That's the character that he played. And they chose him because in many ways, Brad Pitt is one of those people that you look at and think this is a person who's got everything. If I could only have that, I would be happy all the time. And he said, look, I'm sitting in this and I'm telling you, I still wake up every day and look in the mirror and wonder what the hell is going on or think th there's a bunch of crap wrong or this isn't what I want to be or what I'm doing next. Everybody does. And you, you have to kind of get over the solution. You have to limit your time 
on social media, you have to limit your time ingesting these things because they, they can make you sick and you have to find a way to work with them and like a, like a Kung Fu monk. You have to find a way to just work with the parts of the interactions that help and actively screen out the other, other parts, you know, go take your, your Instagram feed and cut out all the, the things that are just a bunch of people posting about how happy they are all the time. You know what? Post, post some, go add some artwork on there. Go uh, find some legitimate travel sites that are posting stuff find something that's posting some legitimate wisdom maybe find some cool clothing shops or things that you want to buy for your significant other you know go go use instagram in a way that is feeding your soul as opposed to you know filling it you know filling it with a bunch of stuff about people partying and uh, posting about how happy they are and all the people you wish you were dating versus the one that you were Delete all that from your feed because getting it into your consciousness all the time is, is just making you sick. Yes, yes. So we're going to wrap up the um, AI blockchain technology hour because you know, <laughs> talked about all of the things tech and climate. Because <laughs> uh, sometimes people forget, I, and I tell people uh, humans are the only customers we have until the AIs take over, mm -hmm. even if it's in the next 500 years. And so I love talking about the um, soft stuff the emotional stuff, the human stuff, those things that make us human. Um, because when, when you, the expression water, water everywhere and not a drop to drink, I'm like, that makes so much sense when we talk about the emotional deserts that technology that's supposed to connect us can create. Uh, and so what I've done is on, on my phone, I set timers for my social media. So I'm at 30 minutes for Facebook, Instagram, et cetera. So, cause I was spending way too much time on my phone. And so the funniest part about social media is that uh, my best friend, whose name is Owen, uh, he lives in Florida. I go hang out with him all the time. He does not take pictures. He does not. And so if people are like, who is this random Jewish guy? I'm like, oh, that's Owen. They're like, I've never seen him before. I'm like, well, that's because you watch the live perpetrated on social media versus being at the table when we go to do some, some shenanigans and we don't want documented for posterity in case we run. <laughs> so I, I, mean, I, I saw this in Berlin where people would go to a concert and maybe four people would have their phone out. You go to, in America, uh, you go to there and, and everyone's got their phone out and it's as if they, they can't experience it unless they're looking through this, this tiny window. It's like uh -huh. life is right in front of you. <laughs> it's it just put your damn phone down and experience it. And again, nothing wrong with your phone. The phone is a magical device. It's just, it's as my father always said in, in his best advice was balance is best in all things. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a very hard uh, thing to live up to. My dad is a hell of a lot better than, uh, than I am. <laughs> I'm more of a man of extremes, but, uh, but uh, I do try to live up to that ideal more and more. And, and again, keep these things in balance, enjoy social media for what it is, but you know what, put the damn phone down and experience life when you're actually sitting there and, 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 and living it. I love it. Dan, I'm taking up 45 minutes of your time. I love the fact that we've said blockchain four times now and not actually talked about it. <laughs> That's right. There's life beyond blockchain. If you have a 30 second thing, or if you want to just say the word, what do you think about blockchain? Go. <laughs> I think that blockchain and uh, crypto has a long way to go currently. There's a number of structural issues, including scaling, uh, dealing with privacy, uh, second layer solutions, actively building something other than money and a full on economic system that people um, can buy and sell things and communicate on is, is, is nowhere to be found in the community. Something I've written a lot about, but it's not there. And for the, for the technology to take off, we have to solve the technical issues, but we also have to build a compelling complete system and not just create a deflationary or a slightly inflationary coin and go, good luck, have fun with that. <laughs> Find a place to spend it. You have to create a place to spend it. You have to create a marketplace. You have to create incentives to people join the network. And I think we may be a little bit farther off than we thought with the initial enthusiasm, but that's okay. The technology is still incredible and it will come to pass. Um, as those uh, problems are taken care of in the next five to 10 years. And maybe it takes even longer than that, but it will, 
affect uh, nearly every aspect of society once it comes to fruition. Awesome, awesome. My name is Samson Williams. You can follow me online at Hustle Fun Babies. This is Daniel Jeffries. You can follow him on the internet everywhere, particularly at practical-ai-ethics.org. Uh, Dan, I've, I just realized we never actually said the name of your book, your self-help book. Uh, so that one's going to be based, it's going to be, it's not out yet, and I'm still working on it currently. Uh, if you if you wanted to join my Patreon, you'll get previews of it. Uh, that's where uh, I've had a number of people, I've been very lucky to be supported by a number of amazing people there. And I always share all my articles and talks uh, and private uh, meetups with me every every month there earlier. So I'm sharing bits of it there, but it's going to be called, it's going to be the same thing as the articles, Mastering Depression and Living the life that you're meant to be living. I'm hoping to have it out by next year. Mm -hmm. uh, and people are getting previews of it already on, uh, on my Patreon, which is uh, just Dan Jeffries' Patreon. It shouldn't be hard to find. Excellent. Dan Jeffries' Patreon, Mastering Depression, the book drop in 2020. I feel like a, a rap promoter at the moment. <laughs> you would do it. You would. You, I, got, I got something to learn for you, man. You are really, you're just killing it. With, uh, you know, it's with, so hard being a black it. nerd because people <laughs> don't understand. I'm like, I don't actually want to go to a concert, but if Dan's going to drop a book, I'm thinking, how do I, I pre-order it so it shows up on my Amazon or my Audible list? Uh, so I'm, I guess I tell all my friends, hey, I got a signed copy of, Get, of Daniel Jeffries, uh, Mastering Depression book. And they're like, Samson, we don't know. We don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, just stay tuned to my channels. It'll, once it's ready to go, again, the Patreon people can see it early and behind the closed doors. And they can be a part of it, too. I want them to experiment with it. I want, I want people to be, I want other psychological guinea pigs to go out there and try this stuff and say, this was terrible, it didn't work, or hey. This is awesome, and I, I discovered this. I think people can actually even help make the book better uh, by contributing, not just uh, uh, by reading it, but also by doing stuff themselves. Awesome. Dan, thanks very much. Continue to travel the globe. Keep us posted. <laughs> Everybody follow him. Oh, Dan, do you have a Twitter? Uh, yeah, so it's uh, Dan underscore Jeffries one, do it, the number one. Uh, if you just do Dan underscore Jeffries, you will find someone who is a... Um, who studies the um, asexual reproduction of frogs. So de <laughs> definitely, uh, he and I have had some funny back and forth over the years. I think he's a lot smarter than me, so you might want to follow Dan underscore Jeffries. But Dan underscore Jeffries, the number one, is me on Twitter. Awesome. Thanks, Dan. Everyone follow <laughs> Dan on the, on the internet. Talk to you later, man. Thank you so much for having me on. Oh, that was it. Cool. You killing the recording there, I think so. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs>